All right. Hello and welcome to the expert inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I'm joined by Mark Steele, who is in probably a little chilly Chicago, I would say. Indeed. How are you, John? I'm great. And I'm in a, well, a San Diego, if I talk about Chile, San Diego, then Mark is probably just going to leave the broadcast immediately. <laughs> probably not much of a comparison <laughs> right now. Exactly. So Mark's an international sales and leadership keynote speaker, TEDx speaker, consultant, speaking coach. Uh, you have a podcast called Invincible Success, and you have a book coming out soon entitled Invincible Success, Amplify Your Sales, Leadership, Speaking, and Life. So you're not so you're going for the big one, not just you know, not just success and work, but life too. I love it. Love it. That's right. It all it all goes together. So that's a, why not? Exactly. So tell me a little bit about the genesis of the book and, and how you come to write it, and and what's the central theme? Sure. In my speaking career, I've done. I focus on sales and leadership. I come from a corporate background. I I was in corporate America in sales for fifteen plus years, and when I left, I knew that I wanted to help salespeople, help leaders be more consistent, have more impact with their customers. But I knew I didn't know it all myself, and so what I went about doing when I started to write the book, not only am I using my own methodology, but I'm using it as an opportunity to reach out to many leaders that I'm connected to and that I admire to get their perspectives on what's going on in today's marketplace to include those insights as well. So that's how it came about. And I've had an incredible time writing it and meeting and having great conversations with leaders in a wide variety of industries. So what are, I know when you sit down to write a book, uh, often there's some things, and when you're doing your research and your interviews, there are things that come up that you weren't expecting or surprising. What were some of the things that maybe surprised you when you were putting this together? I think one surprise for me is because of my primary sales focus, I came at it with a methodology of how can you be more successful with your customers? What do you need to be thinking about when you're in the room with your customer? Those types of things. And it caught me a little bit by surprise that the leaders that I was talking to really spent more time talking about the culture of the organization the the being able to understand and listen with empathy their employees and understand their challenges and I, I guess it shouldn't have been too much of a surprise for me but it did it did catch me a bit off guard by how much how important most leaders feel those soft skills or those more emotional intelligence uh, traits were to successful customer success. So do you think that it, uh, I mean, maybe it's always been like that, but do you think more organizations or leaders are paying attention to uh, how the, to, to the culture of an organization? Because a lot of it, uh, a lot of organizations, the culture kind of develops organically or by default, and it often just reflects the personality of the leader. Do you think more leaders are looking to create a more deliberate culture? I do. I think that because there's more and more emphasis, more availability and connectedness in the world, I think that that, that tends to drive leaders to want to understand more what it is that their their employees are, whether they're feeling rewarded, whether they're feeling connected to the work that they do, whether they're feeling inspired. I think part of it also is part of the, the multi-generational nature of the marketplace today with not only people that are a large group of people that are on the verge of retirement, but also younger people, millennials and, and folks that are just coming out of school they're used to interacting with each other in a very different way. And I think that that's driving many leaders to have to rethink the way in which they connect to their employees. 
Yeah, it's quite a challenge today, isn't it? Because as you say, we run the gamut that is is very is very wide from from people, as you say, retiring right through to generation to the millennials and even the Z's coming through and all of that. And yes, very different ways of consuming inf- information, but also just the way we operate as businesses, right? I mean, we operate ourselves. We operate as we have some offices, but we have a lot of virtual people. We actually probably have a greater degree of virtual or remote. So we have to build a, a, a connected culture using technology. I think every organization today, no matter what field there is, really needs to, in some ways, be thinking of themselves as a technology company. Mm -hmm. Because if they are not embracing some of those technologies, as you say, to be able to connect with experts and resources from around the world, to find customers outside of their direct marketplace, to be able to build new partnerships but also to take advantage of tools that can help automate some of the things that that they're used to doing manually, they're probably missing out. And many organizations will need to really devote some time in, in putting more thought to what technology will be important for their business as they go forward. Yeah, and I think also just the their approach and the whole structure of their business, because as you say, you can now access experts from across the world, right? A lot of the a lot of the things that you need done in a business require a, a high degree of expertise, but you don't always need it, right? Uh, and therefore, you can't hire. Oh, you sometimes there are not jobs you can hire to because they're very specific. And skill sets needed to do this particular project or whatever, but for the rest of the time you're not going to need them. So you have to have that combination of you know, remote workers, multi generation workers, and then people who are uh, you know short term contractors or whatever, and try and bring them all together. It, the organization that I was in in the corporate world is a very well known. Uh, mm-hmm. a technology organization. And one of the things that with the growth of cloud services, one of the advantages of that is near limitless resources on demand. I think that organizations need to be thinking of people in that same way, to be able to, as you say, be able to connect to people, whether they're remote, around the world, wherever, to be able to flex very quickly to be able to respond to an immediate demand by their customer and then be able to, okay, we no longer need those resources for a period of time, so we're we're going to go back down to just our core people Mm -hmm. until the next opportunity comes up. If smaller businesses or medium-sized businesses aren't exploring those options, I I really think they should be. No, I 100% agree. And and I think the other part of that too is the fact that there's a lot of people out there that want to work like that. They want to live where they want to live. They want to have the, they want to uh, be part of what I guess is what called the gig economy. And they want to be able to do, maybe have multiple clients or do work, you know, pile up work when they want to do it and when not when they want to do it. So it's not like it's all one way, it's two way. And I think when you bring those together, yeah, you have an, a companies who can take advantage of that have a tremendous advantage. And there are, for those organizations that, that might not be doing that, mm-hmm. they're certainly, they're missing a wealth of expertise out there. Because mm-hmm. just because I say that I want to live in Chicago, that doesn't mean that I can't add value to a company that's in London or Singapore yeah. or wherever it may be. And so if we're only thinking local, or if we're thinking people have to be in in an office in order to add value to my business, then they're really missing out. And and getting back to where where we started the conversation about culture, right? So you have to then, in a situation like that as a leader, you have to be able to create a culture where uh, full-time people maybe who are in offices, full-time people who are remote, Uh, contractors, part-timers around the globe, you have to be able to mold all of them into some kind of cohesive culture. 
it, it's a, it certainly represents a, a tricky situation. It, the more diverse, diverse and separated we are uh, geographically, and we may be on different time zones and, and not be having conversations on a regular basis, then that certainly increases the, the challenge of trying to, to make cohesive culture stick within the organization. So it's important that leaders develop systems where they're routinely having conversations, whether they're able to do polls, whether they're able to use it, take advantage of some of the social tools to be soliciting feedback of people within the organization and really taking a look at those responses and, and taking action based on that. Yeah, and it is. It, and, and as we said, I mean, it is quite a challenge and you have to be you have to be quite deliberate about it. But the alternative really is that you go to a more traditional model. And if you do so, as we've seen in the past, like you're going to miss out on great opportunities, but it's probably not sustainable. It's like the model. It's funny. And you've probably come across this, but it's funny. You will have say startup companies and then they'll they'll move to silicon valley and they'll get investment and they may have a very disruptive product or business model but the minute they get some money what they do is they build a highly traditional organization like they get a big building and they get everybody and they condemn them to commuting and living in high cost areas like the bay area and stuff and it always seems to me like it's such a funny kind of um dichotomy or paradox is like you know you have a disruptive business model or product, and then you adopt a very traditional company structure. Agreed. And that, that can be very disconcerting for those employees that were there in the <laughs> beginning and, and mm -hmm. want that, that more casual, that agile, the free flowing startup mentality. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly they're being forced to now into a, a structure that they didn't sign up for in the first place. Yeah. And to your point, then, um, any transitions like that, like cultural transitions like that are going to communicate to the customer, right? Because at the end of the day, it's people. Yeah, for sure. And that's what it, it comes down to. You want to make sure that the, the people that are connecting with your customers are, are happy, are passionate, are feeling connected to the work that they do and the company that they work for. So that's, that's why it's essential that leadership is always driving for that cohesive culture. It keeps that at the forefront because to ignore that is, is really at the, the leadership's own peril. Yeah, and the other thing, there was some, uh, I have some statistics somewhere, because uh, I was doing research on it one time about uh, uh, the go-to-market strategy of an organization, and it was quite incredible. I think Forbes had a, had a study at one stage that like four out of five employees at, at major companies didn't really know what their go-to-market strategy, didn't really know what the purpose of the company, in a, in a way that could be communicated well. So customers, depending on who you interacted at the company, you were getting maybe a different story. And so again, to your point, you, especially in a world like this, where everything is so diverse, you have to be very clear in what your go to market strategy, what your vision is, what your, what your, um, what your company principles are. Values. Yeah. And those younger workers, millennials, Gen Z, they're, they believe in, in, they want to try many different things over the course of their lifetime. They, they want to be able to move from organization to organization. And with that in mind, no longer is the, we don't have situations in organizations that, that I'm going to get one account rep that's working with a customer for 20 years. That, that is going the way of the dodo. <laughs> and so you, it's so important that you have that cohesiveness, that, that underlying framework so that as people do move from organization or from account to account to account, just to keep themselves passionate and fresh and, and looking for new opportunities, that the customer isn't continuously going through change, that I can change the face of the representative, but the company I'm doing business with is still that same company that I've had a relationship with for a very long time. 
Yeah, I'm glad you raised that because that's a fantastic point because that is another adjustment that people have to make about the fact is that a lot of these uh, younger people are are not going to join you for five or 10 years. They are going to join. I mean, I think they say in the average for millennials like two years or something. But so, but you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with the fact that you're going to hire talented people and they're not going to, and they're not going to give you a long-term commitment if you can get a good solid, you know, couple of years out of them. And as you say, that you can do that within the context of a cohesive culture that's handed from one person to the other, then that's okay. And, and and the benefit is having having fresh perspectives, mm-hmm. having people not feel complacent and not be bored, if you will, uh, in a particular role and start to stagnate. They can take their eye off the ball. They they're not they're not serving the customer in the same way that they mm-hmm. were several years ago. So there certainly is some advantages to to understanding that that's what's going on in the in the workplace today and being able to be able to respond to that or being able to support that in a way that lets people feel that that is okay and 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 also help those people that do want to stick in in a particular role at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Mark, listen, this has been a great conversation. Uh, But before we go, I'd like you to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can learn more about you and when your book is coming out. Right. I appreciate you asking. The best way to get in touch with me or or get updates about the the book and the the podcast, go to my website, which is marksteel.com. So M-A-R-K-S-T-E-E-L.com. Uh, you can also go to InvincibleSuccess.com. That's the name of the book, the business, the podcast, so all <laughs> things there. The podcast I do on a, a weekly or, or every couple of weeks, we do a new episode of the podcast. And the book itself is for sure going to be available in the summer to early fall of 2020. So almost finished mm-hmm. writing it, then we'll go into the, the publishing process from there. Excellent. And hopefully you'll come back and talk to us when the book is nearing, uh, nearing release and we can talk a little bit more about it. I would love to. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.